Hey everybody, welcome to another Professionally Incorrect. I'm Liam Clisham, and today we're gonna to take a look at how to make this sphere morph to vellum loop. I found a pretty old tutorial of this being done in C4D, and I thought this has probably gotta be a pretty easy setup inside Houdini, especially with some vellum added in there for some flavor. And sure enough, it was. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than most of my tutorials where I just do a walkthrough and then kind of rebuild it. I'm not going to do any walkthrough today. I'm just going to go straight into building this thing and why you're seeing that this is a multi-part series. Uh, just going to spend a little bit more time on talking through some of these things and getting some of the beginner aspects down. So we're going to cover just how to set up the tube and a little bit of animation there getting our initial setup for the transition before going into vellum. We'll do the vellum simulation, and then we'll talk about rendering. So it's probably gonna be a three, four part series. Um, hoping to keep each one pretty short and sweet. That said, let's jump into part one and take a look at building this initial tube animation and transition setup. Starting with a fresh scene inside Houdini, just gonna throw down a quick geometry node like so name it part one so we know where we're at in the tutorial series and let's go ahead and color this why not orange like so because orange <laughs> i don't really have a reason why for the color so to start we're going to build our little tube animation that has the cap that opens up and the tube of balls or not really tube rectangular shape of balls comes through and gets set up for our vellum transition so Let's go ahead and throw down a tube by hitting tab, typing tube, and getting going with that. This is all right, but I want to go down to something a little bit more geometric, looking not so smooth, and six columns is fine, maybe even eight as well. Maybe we'll change it up from how I did the other video. That's looking solid to me, except it's sitting centered on the grid here. And I really want this baseline to be aligned with zero on our Y, so that way it's nice and flush on this grid. So we could manually move it. That's kind of a pain in the ass if you're used to working on C4D and trying to manually move it yourself or you know, having to download a script from somewhere. Luckily in Houdini, we've got this cool tool called Match Size. And we can toss this down here like so. And what it does is measures the bounding region of the object here and lets you snap these uh, this centroid to any point that you want. Well, not any point, but any side of our bounds here. So this side here, this side, top, bottom, et cetera, et cetera. It does more than that, but for our purposes in this tutorial, let's just focus on that. So if I move it to min uh, x here, it would do that. And if I move it to min y here, so on and so forth. So you kind of get the point. It's taking the measurements, moving the centroid to where it needs to go. And it comes in handy too in some forms to use a transform like this. And then you can now pivot around these areas. Not pivot, but your pivot point is now set here. I'm doing great this morning. 9.50 AM, not fully caffeinated. This is going to be a great tutorial. <laughs> Anywho, we've got our match size. That's looking great. I don't need to do anything with the X y, and Z. Just want the Y set like so. I think this is a little too tall, though, for our tube. Uh, I want to squish it down a bit. So you'll see this is where the match size really comes in handy. If I bring this down here, it's now locked in place there. And I'm going to do 1.25 like so. And yeah, looking pretty good. So next we need to get our caps on each side. We could throw that on here and great. That looks awesome, except it doesn't really give us much to work with. It's a single polygon and I want more to work with than that. So we've got this cool poly fill in here. So if you do poly F or even PFI, you'll get poly fill because our tab menu is contextual like that. So that's pretty awesome. And go ahead and throw this in here and that's basically what I want. Let me see what grid does. That's even better. It's the same thing, but aligned how I want. Um, I guess the bottom's not great, but what we're gonna do is take one half of this and use it as our animation to kind of have a door hatch type thing. Open up, slide over, and come back. I didn't do that in the video because I was short on time, but it's a tutorial. Let's have some fun. 
So that's good there. Uh, before we go forward with that, I do want to make sure we're getting some nice thickness and extrusion on the ring of our tube. So let's throw down a poly extrude here. So poly extrude. And what this will do is just like an extrude in cinema, I'll extrude some geometry <laughs> like that. And that's a little far for me. How about 0.05? And we just want to make sure our back is turned on here. I could walk through some additional things with this, uh, but I think if you just read through these things, you can generally figure out what else this SOP does. Uh, that right now it does all the connective components. If you do individual, it'll do individual primitives like so. And you can inset it like so. You can do some fun, cool stuff, but right now I'm just gonna stick to that and yeah, let's throw a bevel down. Bevel these edges, like so. And we'll do that, and you'll see we're getting bevels on every edge, which I don't want. So there's this nice little twirl down up here to exclude certain points. One of its uh, parameters being ignore flat edges, and like so, it'll ignore those flat edges there. And you can control it like so, so if you don't want any bevels on those corners either, and you can go all the way until it ignores everything. I think I'm just fine with the tops. I'm gonna add some more divisions to our rounding in here. Let's do three like so. And this is maybe a little far. Yeah, that's looking all right. Let's see how this looks together. Hmm, you might be wondering, Liam, <laughs> how do we view everything together? And it's actually pretty simple. You can just throw a merge and it will merge both streams together and we can look at it together. However, you might notice something that there's some weird geometry right here. And that's because with our polyfill, it put the fill on top, but it also keeps the remaining or the original geometry that came in, the parent geometry. And you can't really isolate it like that. So what I'm gonna do is throw down a delete that is not a delete, I was typing glass, which is another way, and delete, tried to merge them into a single word, bleat. <laughs> so I delete like so, and turn this on, and I'm gonna be lazy and just manually select those like that. But I wanna keep those ones, so we'll turn our operation from delete selected to delete non-selected. Now we've got just that isolated there. That's looking okay, um, but you know, on both sides. So we'll throw down a mirror like so. And now we've got it on both sides like that. So I don't wanna have to keep having this on and coming back and looking at certain things all the time. So one nice feature of Houdini is you can do a template, which is this little purple flag right there. Like so if I come back to the mirror, so we get this outline, this wireframe like that. So that's great. All right. Now, because we've got the mirror, we can just animate one side of this polyfill. And we do that with a transform. Go ahead, put that there. And that's looking pretty ugly because now I'm animating from this point there and not really with the polyfill. So I'm going to move centroid to origin. And what that does is adjust the pivots and the translation. So the parent object that's coming into the transform here goes to the origin like that. And you can reset these to zero, zero, and that will move this back, but keep the pivot to the center there. You can also use a match size and reset it and do that too. I don't need it perfectly in this center point there. Right here in animating it there is fine. So let's go ahead and start setting some keyframes. Um, yeah, we can start from start from zero. That's fine. And the way we set a keyframe is there's two ways. Uh, you could alt click right here on translate and it will set all of these like so. Or you can alt click on these individually and it will set keyframes. I'm lazy, so I generally just click that and move forward. There is something to be said uh, for if you bring up your animation editor by hitting shift or holding shift and clicking on this over here that you then have all these to deal with, but you can then just isolate it by clicking on one of these translates there. So it's not really a big deal. I guess it is technically extra animation data. So uh, yeah, teach their own. 
If you want to clear a keyframe, you can hold Control Shift and click that there, and it will reset these inputs like so. So yeah, I think zero's fine to start with. I'm gonna just alt click right there on the Y and maybe after 10 frames, it's up here like so. And see, this is why I'm lazy. I just wanna go right here and click. It's nice, easy target instead of coming over here. Uh, so keyframe right there and maybe we hold for two frames put another keyframe, drag out, and like so, put that there, click. And I forgot to put a keyframe here for X. This is why I do the full translate, because I'm gonna probably use it anyway. And do that. I'm just gonna do a full translation keyframe going forward, because yes. All right, so this will be zero there. Nice thing is it'll update if you go back and reset these. So there we go. I've got our animation like so. Looks great, right? I guess we can come in and change some of these. Uh, so Shift S to bring this back up, like I said before, and then if you hit spacebar H, it'll center this stuff up. And maybe we just drag this out a little bit. I'm holding control to keep it even. So there we go. And what's really nice is you kind of get a little bit of an onion skin of what you had before and where it's set at now. And come back and hit play. Like so see that shoots out now. It's kind of cool. I kind of like the slow then Slow, slow, all right, let's shoot open. All right, that is fine for me. So do that and let's take a look at it all together. Kind of comes up like so, except it's pretty thin. Let's go ahead and extrude this side as well. And put it right here, that, and just a little bit like so, and wanna make sure that we've got all of our stuff turned on and you'll see now it's sitting above this area which is fine um, let's go ahead and bring this down a little bit so it's sitting inside and that's fine there holds that point and comes back out and we can even throw a bevel on this one this is one of the things I really love about Houdini is we can just kind of work as our brain works. Like, okay, I want to work on this and then go back and work on this portion and then go back in the stream and rework this. Um, at least that's how my brain works. A little ADHD and just I want to want to work on too many things at once. Um, looks like I'm getting a weird viewport bug. There it goes. Got the bevels off now. All right, so that's looking in pretty sweet like so now what if we want it to loop and not have to animate it and not deal with any code and be lazy well there's something really cool inside of houdini called the motion effects operators or uh chops so kind of weird motion effects but it's called chops and that's because it's actually called channel operators. I, I misspoke by saying it's motion operators. That's mops, which you can get from Toadstorm and is awesome. Uh, but motion effects has some really cool presets of like cycling, cycling with offset, noise, waves, blah, blah, blah. And if we come in here and hit cycle, we'll bring up this panel here and we'll cycle through this stuff. And this stuff, I mean animation. Again and again and again, but I want to mirror it. Oh, actually, not the left side, the right side. So left side is everything before the initial keyframes, and right side is everything after. So we want to do a mirror, like so. And that's looking pretty great, except we don't have any kind of hold happening. So it's fast. It comes up, goes back out, and comes right back in. 
So why don't we hold for six frames like that? And yeah, that should be enough. So I'm just gonna throw that on that keyframe there. It holds and then comes back. Cool. And you know what? Now we don't have a hold at the beginning either. So how long was this? 10? Why don't we hold for 10 here as we come back to the beginning. And I'm going to go ahead and shift click on this to bring this open. Spacebar H to come back. And I'm going to go back to the first frames here and control and paste that there, copy and paste that there. Now we should have some nice holding throughout. Nope, it copied and pasted the other ones. So, all right, zero. Negative four. Why is that not holding? Doot, doot. Okay, so that holds there, comes back and plays like so. I think I need to hold back here. All right, so cool little timeline trick is if you shift click down here, you get this little selector and it allows you to offset stuff. And if you middle click, you can shift it away here. So I'm gonna move this up to 20 like so. And then this way I can put a keyframe here like that. And I believe a zero, 0 0.4 and I give 0 0.04 like so. And now I believe this should give us our hold as it comes back. There we go. All right. Nice recording tutorial hiccups like that. But that's looking good. Um, I think it loops just fine. Yeah. Perfect. Great. So that's the base setup for this here. Uh, the only thing that I'm going to do now is just generate some UVs and some normals for this stuff because that doesn't happen in Houdini like it does with other DCCs. So uh, type normal to put one down on this side. And we'll do the same over here right before the mirror so it gets copied to both. And let's do some UVs. I like using the labs auto UV because I'm lazy. If you don't have labs installed, uh, if you have the launcher here, you can just install it right there and it's super handy. I use it all the time and they have great stuff. And look, I just put this down here and it made some UVs for me. And if I do that over here, look at that. We've got some UVs. I don't know if they're great UVs, but at least we've got them so far. Let's see if UV unwrap. I think that looks a little bit better. Yeah, we'll do UV unwrap instead. All right. That is it for our tube animation. Now we can move on to getting our spheres set up. Before we get going on setting up our grid array and blending and all of that, I wanna talk about the importance of point count and polygon count or primitive count and their order inside of Houdini. So by order, I mean where the points sit. So if I turn this on for a second, you'll see we get our point numbers. And this will be easier to see in just a second, but they all have their respected place in the world here. So uh, let's see if I come in really close. We've got point 15 here. Now we could rotate this object around and have point 15 be somewhere else. And that's really important to take into consideration when you're blending things. Uh, it's something you need to think about too inside cinema as well as your morphing in like a cloner. Um, but it kind of just happens behind the scenes. So let's take a look at this. I'm gonna throw down a box or a cube. If you type either one, it will show up here. And I'm gonna turn on our point numbers again so we can see what's happening. You can see we've got zero, one, two, and three right here and these other numbers there. If I create another box there, bring this over and let's up this to four and four. See, we were introducing new points, which that's problematic because we don't have the same amount of points over here. It's over here. 
Uh, and you can see that by middle clicking, and you see we have eight points, six primitives, aka polygons, vertices, and then you see polygons there as well. And then over here we have 32 and 30. Uh, so one, that's problematic because we just don't have the same amount of points. But if you take a look, our points have shifted around. So 0, 1, 2, 3 is now down there. Not, but 0, 1, 2, 3 is set up like this in our first one. So throwing down a blend shape like so. Do this. If I try to start to blend this, it's taking the first input here and moving the points to where they are on the second input. And it gets all weird. So our initial 0, 1, 2, 3 is now being moved to 0, 1, 2, 3 over here. And we get this crossover. Same with the 4, 5, 6, and 7. It's trying to do that here and move them all over here. So we can fix that by matching these. And just so we know that they're different, I'm going to scale this one up a little bit. And you can see now everything moves where it should. Now, what if we twist one by throwing down a, a transform? And by twist, I mean rotate it around. Let's rotate this up like 90 degrees. Still is OK. It, you know, it, it blends. And you can kind of see there's a little bit of distortion there. But that's OK. You know, it, it's fine for what we're doing here. Uh, maybe we throw a couple more on that there. Let's see if that, that doesn't really matter. Um, but it, it still knows what to do. However, sometimes, even if you set objects up in very similar ways, points get shifted around. I don't really have a good example for that off the top of my head, so I'm going to manually make that happen and force it by throwing down a sort. What a sort does is let's use sort primitives and polygons into different areas. Uh, for example, we've got our 0, 1, 2, 3 set initially there, but if I say by y, you'll notice that we have 0, 1, 2, 3, but then this jumps up to 16 there instead of 4, 5, 6, 7. And that's because it's trying to go around the bottom here and go 0, 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I don't even know where, oh, there it is. So now it's doing this face here, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this bottom face here is now where it's sorting. It's starting at this, well, these faces of the cube and moving up there. And now, if we take a look, it gets super weird because um, it has all these points that are down here now crossing over there. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're setting stuff up is if you have complex objects and you're trying to use a blend on them, you might need to kind of sort things out a bit and move these around. So if I come over here, put this over here, you'll see that things are fixed. And it's because they have the same sort order. Anywho, uh, let's get into the fun stuff. So I'm going to turn off points here. I don't know why I have that one flagged in particular, but oh, it's because we we're looking at the point count. Um, yeah, let's, let's use a super quad. I think that's what I used before uh, because it has some pretty cool properties. So if you type super in the tab menu and throw this down, so you get this thing that looks like a sphere sort of, but could have some more divisions. Let's go ahead and do like 32 and 32. Cool, nice clean sphere. But what's nice about this is you can manipulate these exponents here. And let's go ahead and turn this into like a cube. I can come all the way over and make it a cube. Or I can find an in-between, make a cylinder, make like a weird X thing, diamond thing. Uh, can make some cool stuff. So I like using this instead of the traditional way of using like a cube and then subdividing it and getting the same point count that way. Um, it just gives you all that control inside a single object. So I'm going to go ahead and reset this to one and one for our sphere. Call this sphere. 
And if you right click on this and go down to actions, you can create a reference copy. And what that does is like a super duper, uh, what is it, set driver, set driven in Cinema 4D. So if I look at this, all these things turn to green. And these green indicators mean that it is referencing another channel somewhere. So all these parameters here are actually called channels. And you can see it says CH for channel and then this directory type listing. And it's kind of just like working in Windows or Mac or wherever, like a URL saying, go out of this object, these two dots, go take a look at the sphere one and then find the parameter rad x or radius x. So that's this here. And if you hover over these or hover and hit control on the keyboard, you'll get a little dialog box that tells you what the parameters are. So rad, or rad x, rad y, rad z. So each one of these corresponds with that, rad x, rad y, rad z. If I manipulate this, this one is becoming manipulated just like in the other one. But they're also a relative reference too. So if I manipulate this one, it's linked back here. So pretty cool, except we want to have a different shape over on this one. So let's clear this out, set this back to one. And just like I was showing before with the keyframes, you can hold control and shift and click on these there and these here and start to have these not linked up anymore. Um, we definitely want to leave the rows and columns the same because of what we we're showing with blending, but we can manipulate this. So let's go ahead and let's do like 0.25 by 0.25 and get this cute little round cube doohickey like so. And now we've got the same count. So if I throw down a blend shape like before, slide between these. You'll see we can blend all nice and crisp like without any weird things going on. And just to show you, same thing with the rotation. Let's do a 90 degree rotation there. And we'll kind of spin. That looks a little bit weird because of the rotation. Uh, whatever, good enough. But we don't need that right now. All right, so uh, there's a few different ways to create an array of these things. Mops has great instancing that you can use to do this. Uh, I'm gonna stick to vanilla here. There's a couple of ways that I played about this. One is by throwing down a cube and trying to copy to the points on this cube. And I'm just gonna get rid of this blend shape until we actually need it. So with this cube here, I'm gonna create a null just so I don't have to keep connecting things back and forth between everything. And we'll just call this out and our template for our points here. So type this in here. We've now got this box. And inside Houdini, we've got something called a copy to points that we can put here, add this there and this here. And it will try and copy the sphere to all these points here. And if I up the divisions on these, it'll try and copy them. Uh, everything's a little too big at the moment. We'll, we'll figure that out in just a bit. But uh, I'm going to scale this up so we can really see what's happening and even put some right here. So you can see it's copying to all these points at the intersections here, but we don't get anything in the center. If I can come through here, Ugh, I did a terrible job with that. Like, let's make one less row here. Let's do three and there you go. You can see we get this hole in the center because it, it doesn't make any divisions in the center. It doesn't do any volumetric divisions. So one way around that is to use a points from volume. And this can be a cool little effect. I'm gonna put this up to one so I don't break my machine. And then it fills the object with points. So you can see right there, we've got a grid array of points like so, and it's filled up. But it can be kind of a pain in the ass to work with by manipulating this and it doesn't always fill it right like or I shouldn't say it doesn't fill it right but it doesn't fill it how we want to use it so you can see like we've got these points here here and here 
but they're not right on the corners to keep the shape as we want. So not exactly the way I want to tackle this. The way that I have found to make this work uh, in the most controllable sense and I guess easiest way is to use a grid and copy it a bunch of times. So if I throw this here, the grid has 10 rows, 10 columns, and that's what's happening here. It's trying to copy this 100 times. But let's say we want to do four by four, like so, and do a grid array like this. Or we could even do three by three, which is, I think, what I did. And now we want to do this multiple times. What we can do is throw down a copy transform. And unlike the copy to points, this takes the incoming geometry and clones it. And right now you can't see anything. But if I move this off on translate on the Y there, we start to get copies. And we can do our total number there. And then it will read that on this input, like so. So I'm going to go ahead and scale this down to like one by one. And you can see that our points are too big. So in order to get even points on both sides as far as scale goes, I'm going to go ahead and copy this one over here by just holding Alt and dragging. Uh, I'm going to set an attribute called P scale. And what P scale does is it sets a particle scale or a point scale. So each one of these points then carries that attribute into the copy of the points here. So if you're new to attributes, this might seem a little confusing at first, but I'll, I'll do the best I can to explain it. So I'm going to do create. And the first thing that comes up is attribute create, like so. And we'll just pipe this in and call it p scale. You'll notice nothing happens. It's because our value is set to zero here. So a p scale only is a single value float on the point. There's different classes, things like that. David Torno has an excellent class over at Houdini School that goes over attributes. I'll put a link below, uh, not an affiliate or anything. Uh, truly a great class, but uh, classes are detail primitive points and vertex or vertices. And then we've got different types of floats, which is zero to any number with point values. Integers are nice round values. So one, two, three, four. Vectors are X, Y, Z or quaternions even are four point or four float vector. Strings, which is like text, photo array, blah, 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 blah. Okay, getting long-winded there. Let's just stick with the fact that this is a float. So we can control this with any value, zero to one or, or higher, and bring this up like so. So now we've got a P scale value of 0 0.16. Now, you probably have a geometry spreadsheet over here. I like to have mine docked down here and the way you can do that is coming up here and nope which one is it this one no sorry <laughs> this this arrow up here i was seeing this square here thinking that it was this square here but we want this arrow next to this square and you can do a uh, split pane top and bottom and you'll get this little split pane area here that appears and if you right click or hit the plus sign, you can change it to different types of viewers, inspectors, et cetera. The geometry spreadsheet is an inspector. So you can set that to geometry spreadsheet, or again, hit plus, new pane tab, come to inspector, so on and so forth. So you can now see that we've got our value here for P scale, setting it uh, across all these points. So we've got 53 points listed here, and down here we've got 54. Uh, so it's actually 54 points. We start at zero. I forgot to mention that. So zero to 53, like so. And it's each carrying that value. Uh, you can do some really cool stuff and manipulate it by doing like a randomize. So at randomize. And let's do P scale like so. And we'll multiply against it. And now we've got our initial value and then it's multiplying the from zero to one across each of these points and make it random. But if we do a minimum of one and a value of two, then we'll always have our original size and then it will double up 
on there as well, which is, this can be fun too. Um, when we get into simulating though, we don't wanna have anything intersecting. So I'm just gonna keep the P scale the same and bring these a little bit closer together. So we get that nice array. And if we look, now I've got these ones there and these ones in the exact spot. I can throw down blend shape like so. Ugh. Blend shape like so. And blend between them. So we're getting there. We're getting to uh So now let's think about how we can animate this and then do the the transition between the two objects here. Um, first thing first is since we're copying to these templates here, we need to animate the template. Um, not the blend shape, nothing else, but the template. So let's go ahead and throw down a transform like so. We're gonna put it right here at the end of our line right before out to our copy to points. And what that's gonna do is allow us to move these and animate these. So if we take a look and template this over here, you can now see that one, our grid is too big for this. And two, it needs to be below. So with that template going, let's go ahead and scale this down a bit. Um, you can scale it manually by middle clicking over these to bring up your ladder, or you can scale both at the same time by clicking on this here. And why did that not pick up? I think I'm getting a weird viewport error. Yep, I am, because that's not updating. All right, well, another handy thing is Labs has a reset viewport. If you don't have Labs installed, it also shows up over here, I believe in newer installs. Um, so you go to Labs, reset viewport, and it should clear out that bug. There we go. That was weird. So now we can bring our size down like so. And that's good, but our spheres are too big. So now we can adjust our P scale as well, like so. And I think our distance is getting to be a little, here, I'm gonna bring this up a little bit more, like so. Can probably even go a little bit further. A little bit further on both of those. All right, and then we'll scale this back down. And there's procedural ways to hook this all up. So I could chain this to our copy with some math. And so based on how many uh, rows and columns and the sizes of those, then that would affect our P scale. Um, for this beginner style tutorial, I don't think we really need to get into all that. That's for another tutorial. But you can make all this procedural so you don't have to keep coming back and forth to all of it. And yeah, we'll bring that down there. All right, that's looking better. Just gonna make sure our blend, we don't have any intersections there. Cool, all right, so now we've got that as a good size. Let's focus on animating this, which is, going to use the transform from our lowest grid there since that's where we're copying from. We can bring this down like so and let's watch. So this comes up there and right around 24 is when it opens. So I think let's start at 20 animating there and we have until about 48 to get through. Yeah. So we need to be fully cleared by there, like so. Okay, that's looking right to me. I'm gonna hold Alt, click again, and we've got that set. And so if we just throw down a merge to see them both at the same time, hit play, comes up, uh, comes up like that, and then resets, cool. I think that's looking all right. Um, we, we could do like some overshoot and stuff like that, but let's keep this simple with the animation stuff. Uh, I think I'm gonna rotate it though. So come back here, I'm gonna hold Alt on rotate to set the zero there, and let's do a fun little 180 
that. So as it comes up, am I gonna get another viewport issue? Wow, oh, I'm getting like double. I'm really sorry about that. This usually doesn't happen. I wonder if it's because I'm recording. Okay, cool. So that comes up, rotates around like so, and that slams shut, and boom, reset. So good. All right, um, let's talk about transitioning between this. So we obviously can manually animate this like so, and you know, that's fine. Sure, we could do that. I want to animate them uh, individually or just uh, maybe even introduce a little bit of chaos to it. All right, so thinking about a couple different ways to approach this, um, I think the best way to go about it is using a mask from target. Yeah, I think that's gonna be the best way. So what this does is it creates an attribute called mask, kind of like the P scale here. And it'll show up over in our view or our geometry spreadsheet as well. You can see now we've got mask. And what's happening is this mask is like a field inside Cinema 4D, where based on where this point is in space, because it's currently set to point, it'll create a fall off and try to transition. Um, but what's cool is we can also if we come back and set just that one set it to a line, which a line makes a fall off based around the radius of that line there. So infinitely in space going in whatever direction you set it at, but you can build a, a, a radius around there, or you can even do a plane, like a plane effector inside C4D or plane fall off. And we can set that to whatever direction we want. I'm going to set it to one like so. So now we have this fall off coming through here. And we can use that mask attribute to drive our blend shape. What that's gonna do is if you take a look over at the geometry spreadsheet as this animates through or as we move it through, you'll notice some of these values start to change and it goes all the way down to zero. And then transitions back up to one. And again, I'm having a viewport issue. This is just awful. Um, I'm definitely gonna have to file a bug <laughs> after this. It's, I don't know what's up with my scene and why it's doing that. But anywho, you can see this transition happening there. So we're gonna take that and come into our blend shape. And there's lots of stuff down here about blending and blend masking and all that. What we wanna do is come to our blend mask parameter and set it from an attribute here. And it's already gonna look for a mask. You can type in whatever you want. So if I were to call this taco, we'll see this now is called taco over here. We can come down to blend shapes and call this taco and it'll look for that. Um, we don't have this on both sides. We want to set this to from first input. And now, as we move this through, I'll make sure to flag this, it'll start to blend. Wow, viewport. This is just awful. It'll start to blend between the two, like so. I wonder if it's because of this so weird and even like this white that's happening on there usually doesn't happen um i don't know why it's doing that it's really really strange anywho so that's how we get our transition i'm gonna go ahead and just keep this as mask so we know and this will be mask as well and we can animate it so this comes up like that there and why don't we start the animation a little bit as it's transitioning? Um, we gotta come over here on our mask target, and for our origin, hold down control and set our first keyframe. And this closes right around there, and then once the loops start again. So we want this transition to happen pretty quickly. Let's go ahead and do 
60. And we'll bring this down like that. Get that out of the way. I'm going to turn these off. Hopefully we don't get any weird viewport errors anymore. Go forward like so, and boom. That's pretty fast. I don't know if I want it that fast. Come middle click on this like we did before. Let's drag it out to 72. I'm not going to mess with any easing and animation handles right now. Just kind of get a rough blocking of this. Sweet. So we've got this. Rotates up like so. Transitions and boom. So perfect. Just just enough time that we can set this off and then our vellum will have about a second to activate and transition. Uh, we might need to retime this a little bit, but I think we're ready to start moving into our vellum simulation. So that's it for part one so far. Uh, as we move forward, part two, we'll start getting this prepped for vellum. And then part three, we'll talk about getting it ready for rendering and going through all that. Maybe even a part four. We'll have to see how long vellum turns out to be. All right, thanks everybody. And I'll see you in part two.